Amen. Amen. Well, I mentioned earlier that we're having a baptism on September 10th, and I just want to mention a, a few things about uh, September 4th. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, September 4th, we're having the baptism service. And uh, in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, uh, Jesus himself said, He who believes will be, and is baptized will be saved, and he who believes not, of course, it will be condemned. And so a baptism is such an important aspect of following after the Lord. And we, we don't want to take that lightly at all because Jesus himself, the one that we follow, uh, was baptized. And I want to emphasize also is to we need to make sure that we are baptized as a believer because there was all kinds of people who were baptized even before Jesus' day, but it was for something else. It had nothing to do with being born again. But when we are baptized as believers, we're making a statement of faith that we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, that he's the one that we worship, he's the ones that we adore. And so in the, we, we have a little bit of a description of a, an Ethiopian who, Ethiopian who is being baptized in the book of Acts, chapter 8. And we're going to pick up that a little bit. And Philip was used by the Holy Spirit to preach to the people in Samaria. And then God told him to go along a certain road because there was an Ethiopian there that he wanted to talk to. And in verse 26 it says, And now the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship. Now, he was driving along the road. He was going back, and, and the Spirit of the Lord to, uh, spoke to Philip and told him to run up by the chariot that, he was, uh, that this Ethiopian was riding on. And he found out that the Ethiopian was reading from the book of Isaiah. And he was reading from, actually, Isaiah 53. And the, the, uh, the Ethiopian thought, you know, he didn't know much about it. And Philip asked him, he said, do you know what you're talking, what you're reading? And the, Philip, uh, the Ethiopian said, well, how could I know unless somebody explains it? So in verse 35, it says, Then Philip opened his mouth and, beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him, beginning at uh, in Isaiah 53. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the, eth the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Isn't that an interesting statement? He said, what hinders me from baptized? Soon as he, as he learned about Jesus, soon as he learned about the, Jesus being the Messiah, he wanted to be baptized. He, he, that was the first thing on his mind. He said, I want to be baptized. I want to become a follower of, of Jesus. Therefore, I want to go through the waters of baptism. And that was the very first step that he took. So as believers, that's what we want to do. Uh, after salvation, we want to come and go through the waters of baptism. Philip, uh, he said, the eunuch said, what hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's why a lot of times when we, when we baptize people, one of the first things that we say, we ask them, have you committed your life to Christ? Have you made Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior? And as they answer and in in, in affirm that, then we uh, baptize them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. And so uh, Jesus said, uh, pardon me, Philip told him that if he believed in his, in his heart that he could be baptized. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Hallelujah. Uh, when I read stories like that, it's just always amazing to me how supernatural it is to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Philip, Philip here was uh, in, uh, in Samaria. He was sent, sent down to Samaria, and all kinds of supernatural events took place. Uh, devils were cast out. People were healed and so forth. And then the Spirit speaks to Philip to go on another mission, and he plants him on this road going to Gaza. And after he fulfilled his mission, uh, God supernaturally moved uh, Philip out of there 
and he took them away soon when they were still in the water. Uh, Philip was transported into another area. Man, that's supernatural stuff. Christianity is a supernatural uh, experience that you and I are supposed to have. It's a supernatural event. And you might say, well, pastor, there's nothing really happening supernatural in my life. Well, I want you to know this, that if you're a born-again believer, there's plenty supernatural happening in your life. That's what got you saved in the first place. It took a supernatural event to get you into the kingdom of God. And it also takes a supernatural uh, lifestyle in order to keep you living for God. Because it's the power of God that gives you the ability to live for Him. You can't do it on your own. I can't do it on my own. It is the power of God living on the inside of us that helps us live every day the life that Jesus wants us to live so that we can be conformed into His image. It is a super natural experience. Glory to God. I'm so glad of that. I'm thrilled that it's a supernatural experience. And often we think once we get saved that we live life on a daily basis and we don't see a lot happening. And sometimes we get the, into the thinking that we can do it on our own. What do I mean by that? That we can, we can just go through life without a supernatural experience. And we, uh, we tend to we tend to slack off our desire to be connected with Jesus, with the Father, who is a supernatural being. The Bible says that God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So when we worship God, it's more than just singing songs. The world sings songs, but we are supposed to worship God in spirit and in truth. In other words, our lives ought to be lined up by, uh, with the worship that we bring before God. Uh, we can't go out and living like the world and, and dishonoring people and, and doing things that we shouldn't be doing and so forth and then come in here and think that we're holy by raising our hands and singing uh, nice Christian songs. No, we are to worship God in spirit and in truth. This, when we come to worship God as a group on, on Sunday mornings or any time that we gather together, it should... That's just a, uh, should be an overflow of our experience that we've had all week. I hope we don't wait till Sunday morning meeting, and that's the only time we worship the Father, the only time that we worship God. Um, <clears throat> Mike, when he was praying, he, he said, Lord, everybody's here. They're, they want something. There's some things that they need. There's some things that they want. And I often thought, well, one, one of the things that I want I, I, I ask the Lord often, Lord, help me to experience Psalm 37 where it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. And that word delight there means to be pliable in the Lord. It means to be secure in him. It means to be pliable, easy to mold. And I want to be in the hands of the Lord. I want to be pliable. I want to be molded in the shape that he wants me in. I want to do the things that he wants me to do. And that's what I say. I want the most, Lord. I need the most. I need you to mold me and shape me. Lord, if you leave it to me, I'll make a mess. But Lord, shape me, mold me into what you would want me to be, I pray in Jesus' name. Just take a minute right now and ask the Lord to do just that upon you. Father, God, help us to be pliable in your hands, I pray. Help us, Lord, to be so willing to be molded and shaped according to your will, according to your plan, according to your purpose, I pray. Shape us, Lord, according to your design for us, Father, I pray. God, don't let us go day in and day out and not being molded by you, God, not being shaped, Father. Lord, help us, God, to be the, the, the clay on the potter's wheel, Lord, that you, you mold us into whatever shape you want us to be. Spirit, soul, and body. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. What a, what a privilege it is to be in the hands of the potter, in the hands of the, of the one who, wants, who knows exactly how we can be shaped. And he does it in ways that will bring us the most joy and fulfillment. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I may, I better... Move on and getting happy just talking about that. Well, I, I, every once in a while, somebody sends me a text uh, during the week and says, how come you don't talk much about tithing anymore? 
And I used to talk a, a quite a bit, a, a, a lot more probably about that, but it just seems there's so many things to say. There's so many things that I, I believe the Lord is stirring up that, you know, I, I haven't uh, mentioned a lot about that, but there's some things uh, that we, we can't ignore that subject of, of money because what do you do in this world without money? I mean, when you get up in the morning, uh, you know, you're, you often either turn your air conditioner on and in the wintertime you turn your heat on. You don't go anywhere without it costing you something. Without, you don't do anything without uh, finances. You don't eat without finances. And so it's very much a part of our, part of our lives. So I'm just going to talk for a few minutes about that this morning. And if you don't talk like me talking about money, well, blame, on the, blame it on the person who sent me the text. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, there's, a, there, there's something about uh, finances and the church in general that they haven't, the church and finances, it seems like they haven't been able to get along. In other words, uh, a lot of people seem to have a problem when the preacher talks about finances. Uh, Chris Valentin, Valentin said this, he said, uh, he said, I believe that the, the church seems to have a love affair with poverty. And I thought, wow, that would be, that'd be a lousy place to be, I have a love affair with poverty. And uh, it, it's certainly true, I, I agree with him in, in a lot of cases, I don't, I'm not talking about our church in general, but... But uh, I'm talking about church as a whole. That uh, it seems to me that they, a lot of times the church has a difficult time uh, recognizing that the Lord desires for us uh, to have uh, all our needs met over and above beyond that because, so that we can be a blessing to those ar- around us. And the, one of the greatest examples, of course, we have for that is Abraham. Uh, Abraham is our is our father of faith, and we certainly want to look to him uh, to see how he lived, how he carried his life, uh, how he carried his life out, and how he walked before God. And as we see the fruit of that, we recognize that here's a way to walk in which we might bring pleasure to the Father and open the gates of heaven that he might pour out a blessing for us that we're not even able to receive it. I mean, it's just we're blessed so much that we're not even able to receive it. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, God said to Abraham, he said, I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you and make you a great name, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who curse you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, that is a a statement that God made to Abraham, and the Bible calls him the the father of our faith, and we are connected to believing Abraham through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if God told Abraham that he was going to be blessed in order to be a blessing, he's telling the church, I want to bless you so that you can be a blessing to the world. I want to bless you so that I can pour blessing through you onto the world onto the, this culture that we live in. And it's God's desire for that to take place. He wants us to be blessed so that we can be a blessing. Now, how did God bless Abraham? Well, one of the ways that we did, we read it in Genesis chapter 14, verse 2. Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. Now, he told him he was going to make, he was going to bless him, and then we see the kind of blessing that he brought into Abraham's life. He was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. He he gave, he put into Abraham's hands what the blessing in the natural so that he could bless others in the natural, but he also uh, brought Abraham into a relationship with him where he could hear him and he tested him and seen his faith was solid. And God still wants us to use Abraham as an example for our faith. He believed God beyond what was happening in the natural. He believed that God would bring him a great blessing, not only in the natural, but also in the, uh, in the spiritual as well, because God told him that he was going to have a son and that his son would uh, be in the line of, of bringing blessing to the world. And his son Isaac was born supernaturally. He was conceived supernaturally. They were old. Sarah was 90 years old. Abraham was 100. Wow, that's a supernatural birth. And he, came, he brought that forth. 
So God blessed him in that line as well. God declared something over Abraham, and he, God, brought it to pass because Abraham believed him. I mentioned Psalm 33 a while ago. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So he puts a desire in you. So God put a desire in Abraham for a son when he spoke that to him, when he prophesied to him that he would have a son that would rule. God uh, gave him that desire. Abraham believed, but he had to turn it over to God because he was too old to bring it to pass, and God bring it to, brought it to pass. And uh, Psalm 37, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you desires of your heart. Commit your way unto him, and he will bring it to pass. Glory to God. So when God puts the desires in your heart, you, you have to do what you need to do in order to open the door for it to happen, but he's the one that's going to bring it to pass. You know, sometimes we have a prophetic word. Uh, somebody will, might speak out a, a prophetic word about us, might give us a, a, a direction or something that God is going to do in our lives in the days ahead. But, you know, after we get the prophetic word, we have to make sure that we make room to have that prophetic word carried out. We make sure that there's a, we, we understand that there, there's a method uh, of carrying that prophetic word out. In other words, we just can't pay no attention to it and think, well, if God wants to happen, it's just going to happen. Well, no. Uh, I remember uh, I heard a, a man recently, he said this, he said he was praying for a young man. He, a young man was 12 years old, and he had a, a powerful word for him, a prophetic word about his destiny and so forth, and the man fell on the floor. But the Holy Spirit came upon him, and he shook for over an hour under the power of the Holy Spirit, a, a, a powerful experience. And then... Uh, of course, uh, that service was over, and the next service, that young man wasn't there. And the next service, that young man wasn't there. Week after week, that young man wasn't there. And after the third or fourth service, the minister asked him, where is that young man anyway? Asked his mother that. And his mother said, oh, I, uh, I, registered, him in, I registered him in soccer. Isn't that sad? Now, some of you don't think that's sad at all. You don't think it's, it's, it's out of place at all to have... Register your children for soccer. That's going to take away a Sunday morning coming together as a body of believers. But I'm telling you right now, it is absolutely the devil's strategy in order to steal our kids. And here's this young man, had a prophetic word over him, had a powerful experience in the Holy Spirit. And what's his mother do? Register him for a sport on, on Sunday morning. That's going to take his time up rather than coming together at the body of Christ and finding what else, what else God has got to say. In, in those things, in order to fulfill his prophetic destiny. No, there's words that come to us uh, that uh, we, we hear and understand, but we have to make room for it as well. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way unto him, and he will bring it to pass. Without the committing your way unto him, is he going to bring it to pass? I don't think so. First, we must commit our way unto him, and he will bring it to pass. He'll open the door somehow, some way. He'll make it happen. The desire that he puts in your heart. And here God told Abraham that he was going to bless him. And he did bless him. And, and Abraham began a practice of, and he actually set in, in place a practice for you and I to follow. It says in Genesis chapter 14, well, let me uh, go back a little bit. Uh, Abraham uh, went uh, and he rescued his nephew, Lot, who had, been, uh, who had been captured, and a group of other people had been captured as well. And, and so the, God, he asked, Abraham asked God, should I go after the, this army that captured my, my nephew and so forth? And, and Abraham took his men, and they went after him, and they won the battle, and now they're on their way back. And Abraham comes, and he meets a man called Melchizedek. And we read about it in Genesis chapter 14. And uh, this Melchizedek, uh, some theologians actually be, believe it was, it was Jesus himself. But it says in verse 18, Then Mel Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. It wasn't just any ordinary priest. He was priest of God Most High. He brought out bread and wine. What is bread and wine, uh, what, is it, what is the type of, or what does it represent? Covenant. Covenant. He was about to make covenant with him. And in verse 19, 
the Bible says he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And he, that is Abraham, gave him a tenth of all, gave him a tithe of all, gave him a portion of what come into his hands, he gave it to Melchizedek. Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons and take... King of Sodom was one of the people who were captured along with Abraham's nephew. The king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. So here Abram was saying that uh, he didn't want anything that belonged to the king. And one of the reasons why he didn't want any of it, because he didn't want this Sodom, this king of Sodom, in other words, representing the kingdoms of this world. He didn't want to say that the world made me rich. He didn't want to say that uh, the king of Sodom made me rich. Why? Because he said, I'm trusting God. I'm leaning on God. He's the one that's going to meet my needs according to his riches and glory. He's the one that's going to uh, meet everything that I, that I need, and I'm not going to go to the world. I'm not going to go into the world system and forget God and think that the world system can meet my needs. He says, I'm going to allow God, and he proved that by giving a tenth of what came into his hands to Melchizedek. And that's why uh, we as a church believe that God uh, is, uh, is saying that a tenth of what comes into our hands, a tenth of our income, belongs to God. And uh, we, co- we come and we bring it before the Lord, and the Bible says that we are to even test him in this in Malachi. Malachi chapter 3 tells us to test him in this fact, to see if he will not open the windows of heaven for us and pour out such a blessing that we're not able to, ha- to hold. So this is how we say that we are not looking to the world for, uh, to meet our needs. We are actually looking to the Father when we bring uh, our tithe and our giving to the Lord. It is a way to keep us from falling into the trap of the deceitfulness of riches. Because Jesus said, Be, beware of the deceitfulness of riches. But if we, if we love uh, these riches, if we hang on to them, if we think that they're the answer to our happiness, then uh, we'll, be, we'll be left alone. We'll be uh, striving. We'll be, uh, actually the Bible says that money is the, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. One man says, I bring my money and I give it to the Lord. I, I, I give uh, to the, the Lord because it protects me from the dragon and the dragon of, of wanting more, the dragon of always wanting something bigger, always wanting our appetite increases. No, when we hold out our hand and give to the Lord, it puts things in perfection perspective and we declare we declare that we, he is the one who meets all our needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus hallelujah some somebody some people think money is evil if you ever run into anybody who thinks money is evil then you should suggest to him that he give it all away. Because the book, the Bible tells us to flee from evil. Well, <laughs> maybe I'll get off that tap talk. But I'm not getting too many amens out of this. No, but you preach again. Yeah, it's got to be preached. It's got to be preached. It's got to be taught. And the reason why, why, why do you do that, Pastor Bill? Well, you know, it's to uh, pay the oil bill and the lights and all this place. No, that's not why I do it at all. In fact, if you don't give a dime, things will be still paid for. The fact of the matter is I'm, I'm speaking, I share this with you because I want to see you blessed. I want to see you, uh, I want to see all your needs being met. I want to make sure that you open the door to the Lord for he can come in and bless you. 
Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. And anybody who opens the door to me, I'll come in and sup with him. Well, do you want him in your finances or not? Well, you can open the door by giving, by paying your tithe and so forth, and allow him to come in into that area of your life so that he can bless you. You are to be blessed and to be a blessing. And some of the things that you are required to do in life, you cannot get enough money on your own working two jobs and <clears throat> getting raises and so forth. It will not happen. The Bible says a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Well, if you're going to do that, if I'm going to do that, I need help from God some way, somehow. And it doesn't matter how much money I make because I could make $150,000, $200,000 a year or even more. But if I don't know how to manage it, I can still be broke. I'll just be a poor man with money. No, God gives us wisdom to be able to handle it as well. Could you handle the wealth that God gave Abraham? You know, probably a whole bunch of people in here say, yes, I could, I could. I, I seriously question that. Because some of us are not even handling properly the money that comes into our hands now. Amen, Pastor Bill. Let's go somewhere else. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, last week I talked about a verse in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And it says, I also say to you that you are Peter. Now, he's, Jesus is talking to Peter. And on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell or the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, last week we spoke about uh, Jesus was asking his disciples, who do people say that I am? And some of the disciples were saying, well, some say that you are a prophet, and some say you're a teacher, and some even say that you're a Messiah. And then Jesus turned to them and said, but who do you say that I am? And this is a question that each one of us has to answer. Who do we say that Jesus is? Who do we say that he, we say that, yes, he's, he's our Messiah? Yes, but do we also say that he's our provider? Do we also say that he's our deliverer? Do we also say that he's our healer? Or do we confine him to one particular area? But the, Jesus is our healer. He is our pro provider. He is our deliverer where we need deliverance. He is everything that we need. So, but unless we say that, unless we agree with that, unless we acknowledge that, then we might just be believing him for salvation after we leave this place. Now, that's a good thing. It's a good thing to believe God for salvation, that you're going to heaven after this place, after, after we leave this place. We're, none of us are going to get out of here live. We're all going to have to leave. And the day, the, our end days are going to be lived either in joy or in... Uh, in this place of fear. I don't know if there's any Star Trek fans in here, but you remember William Shatner? William Shatner turned 92 years old. And this is the thing he said. He said, I don't know what's next, and I'm scared to death of it. He said he's living in fear of what's going to happen next. What a way to end your life. He actually said the Christians believe in, the, in the God uh, and I wish I did too. And I'm thinking, well, man, all you have to do is make a decision to recognize that God is real. And he'll give you the faith to believe in Jesus. You don't have to be in a state of fear. What a terrible place, what a terrible way to end your life, be in a place of, of fear because you don't know what's going to happen next after you leave this place. When you take a step out of this earth into eternity, Every one of us, surely, that brings us great peace to know that we'll be with Jesus. And I'm absolutely convinced that when we leave this place, that there'll be a host of angels that will usher us in to glory. Hallelujah. That there'll be no fear whatsoever. Fear is driven away from us. God, we pray for William Shatner right now, God. Send somebody to him, God. Somebody that he'll listen to that will cause him to open his heart to Jesus, we pray. God, that his mind will, be, will recognize, God, that there's a way out of this. 
And Father, touch him, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus said, I say unto you, you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will build my church. Everybody say church. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, as I said last year, this is the first time that this word is used in the New Testament. This Greek word is used in the New Testament. And I want to tell you what it means. I want, and the, <clears throat> it means in, in that day, in this, in this culture that they lived in, it was an assembly, a legislature as, assembly, or selected ones. This is not a religious term at all, but a political and government term that is used many times in classical Greek for a group of people who have been summoned and gathered together to govern the affairs of the city. For Jesus to use this term means he is giving the keys of government authority in his kingdom to the church. Glory to God. So this word ecclesia here is, speaks to us about Jesus is saying, I'm going to rule this world. I'm going to set up my kingdom. My kingdom is going to have influence in every area of life. It's going to have influence in the government systems of this world. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He said, and the Bible says in Revelations, it says that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. So he's saying to, to the church, I want you to be influential in the, the government around you in the legislative assembly that's making laws. I want you to be influential so the laws that are made are laws that will enhance my kingdom as opposed to being opposed to my kingdom. God is saying he wants us to be active in this field. You know, a lot of people say, well, the church has no business in government. We, we are, it should be totally uh, divided church and state. That never did work, never was, and never will, as long as there are believers in the world. Uh, we are to have some influence in, what, in, in the government. You know, we look at the, our, our neighbors in the South, and, and many criticize them and because they, they take their uh, pol politics so serious, they, they make a religion out of it and so forth. And, and uh, there may be an, an extreme to that, all right. I, I don't doubt that a bit. But uh, many times I think we lead, need a whole lot more of what they've got too much of. Did you get that? Sometimes we have to realize that if we're ever going to make an influence in this world, in the system that we live in, then we're going to have to influence the government system. But most of the church, unfortunately, uh, are doing only the things that will make things comfortable in this life. All we're worried about for us going through this life and then getting out of here, rather than realizing that we have a responsibility for the generations coming behind us. We have responsibility to set things in place so they, our children and our children's children will have the best opportunity to come to Christ, to know him, to live for Jesus, rather than just turn it over to those who are trying to lead our children astray. And there's lots of that taking place. Have you ever wondered, I know I certainly have, maybe, maybe you haven't, but have you ever wondered how communist countries like China, how uh, they, they are determined to push down uh, the Christian influence uh, and they persecute uh, Christians and, and shut down churches and they want to make everything, uh, they want to put everything under their thumb? You ever wondered why? What's the reason of that? I mean, the, the house church over in China, they say there's probably 200 million uh, of the, uh, Christians in the house churches and they're illegal churches in China but yet they're, they're functioning and operating. But you, have you ever wondered why the government wants to put down uh, people who are helping others, who are, are giving life to others, who are, in some cases, feeding the poor and, and so forth? Why would a government want to do that? I'll tell you why. I believe it is because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this age and spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. These spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, they are behind the ruling powers, the government powers in places like China and, and lots of other places, including uh, North America as well. They are behind these governing powers and they're doing everything they can because they know that the church are the, are, are the rightful rulers, rightful influencers of the government. And so they want to keep make sure that the church doesn't have a voice in this land or this time that we live in. Because if the church has a voice, then the church will put people in there who will honor God. 
And so I, I believe that in, in this day that we're living in, we must, we must ask the Lord, how can I influence my society? Lord, how can I be a beacon of light in the midst of the darkness, the darkness of this world, the darkness that's over our politicians, the darkness that's uh, involved in, in, every, in, in all the bureaucracy of our government? How can we be a light in that? How can we speak into that? How can we pray into that? How can we, be, how can we have an influence in that? Now, you might say, well, you know, the gods of this world are powerful. And the gods of this world are manipulating society and culture. And they are, aren't they? But you know, the Bible says that greater is he, you that, is he that is in you than he that is in the world. In other words, you, ha- you can have greater influence than those dark forces, than those dark powers. You can have a, a much greater influence in, in uh, proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord as they do of complaining the God of this world as they're the one that is to be the ruler. You, can, you have a greater power living on the inside of you. You are more influential than the forces of darkness. You are more. The Bible says in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 37, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. You are a conqueror. You are a conqueror. I, I read or looked at uh, somebody was preaching recently at a church named Champions. I thought that's a great name for a church, Champions. That's who we are in Christ. We are champions. We are more than conquerors. Well, a conqueror is a champion. And it's a champion in any field. In every, any field that God leads us into, we can be a, a champion. John 16, says, These things I have spoken to you, Jesus himself saying this now, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. And you and I are to be Jesus' hands and feet in this world. You and I are to be the expression of Jesus in this world. And I believe that Jesus said, if if he said, I have overcome the world, he's saying, I have overcome the world for you, and now you are overcomers. You are to overcome the world's system. You are not to bow down to it. You are to overcome it. You are to operate in the God kind of system. You are op- to operate in the kingdom of God system because the kingdom of this world system is a kingdom of death. But the kingdom of God system is a kingdom of life, life and holiness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's a kingdom of, of happiness. It's a kingdom of healing. It's a kingdom of deliverance. It's a kingdom of provision. It's a kingdom of whatever we need, it, it is met. I mean, the, the, uh, the Father says, all that I am, all that I have now belongs to you because I've made a covenant with you. And even the angels look at mankind and say, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you share, that you want to have fellowship with him? Because the angels don't have that sense at all of fellowship with God. They are big and strong and they always have attention. But man, man has been created so that we might have fellowship with him. That we might come in with him and and sit down and, and have a cup of tea with him. And just talk to him and share with him what's on our hearts. Why? Because he loves us. He cares about us. Just the same way as we love and care for our children. He wants us to come to him with an open hand so that he might bless us. Now, folks, the blessing of God is here for every believer. And God is not keeping back blessing from us. I've heard a a minister say recently that his his daughter had, they they had recently bought a home and she was showing him around and and, uh, they didn't have any drapes in the home or nothing. And uh, he said, uh, he told his daughter, he said, just go down to so-and-so where they make these drapes, measure them all up, take it down, and uh, I'll pay for the whole thing. I'll, I'll do the whole thing. Uh, I'll, I'll fill your house with whatever is needed as far as drapery goes and so forth. And she said, oh, no, Daddy, you can't do that. I wouldn't want you to do that. No, Daddy, I, I can't you do that. So he said, I went out, got in my car, and went home. And so he, next time he was there, there was something else that she needed, a, uh, something in a rug or something, and he wanted to buy it for her. And she said the same thing. She said, uh, uh, no, Daddy, I, I, wouldn't, I can't let you do that. I wouldn't allow you to do that. Uh, you know, I don't want to use your money to do that. So he said, I got in my car and went home. And then he said he was talking to her another time. 
And he said uh, they had just bought a car. And he said, I suppose you had to go to the bank and get a mortgage for that car, did you? And get a loan for that car? And he said, yes, of course we did. And he said, well, let me know where the bank is, and I'm, I want to go in and pay, pay for it. And she said, okay. <laughs> and he was saying, I've been trying to bless you all along, and you didn't open the door for me to bless you. Sometimes that's what we're like. We don't set ourselves into a place in believing somehow, some way that the Lord is going to bless us. We just try to struggle through life, put up with the things that are making, just barely getting through. And the Lord wants to bless us. But he's, we're not going to be able to receive the blessing without getting into our closet and getting alone with him, getting to know him, getting to understand his ways, getting to honor him. Honor him in everything that we do. Honor him in what we say. Honor him in what we think. Love what he loves. If for no other reason, that's why I love every one of you. Because God loves you. And I sure don't want to turn my nose up at what God loves. I don't want to ever think there's a group of people I don't want to hang around with if God loves them. God loves each and every one of you. And he gives, he gives me a passion for each one of you to do your very best to be blessed by God, to receive the good things that God has for you, to have your heart open to everything that he has for you. Why? So Jesus can be exalted in this world. Jesus can be exalted through your life. That somehow, some way, the pleasure of Jesus will go from you to others around you. And he'll leave a residue on the inside of you that will just bless you tremendously. I was praying and, and I was thinking about how much I like talking about the anointing of Jesus. How I love to say that Jesus Christ was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. I love talking about the anointing of Jesus that was upon him and how it, it flowed from him and people were healed and people were delivered and set free and the anointing changed the atmosphere and all that kind of thing. You know why I love talking about that? Because when I begin to talk about it, when I, when I speak about it, the anointing gets all over me. And I just, and, and it, I love that anointing. It seems like you're in an atmosphere that the Lord is in. And somehow you just step into it and that anointing encompasses you. And you know then that the Lord, uh, out, of, out of that anointing, you want everybody to experience. I remember the first time I ever seen the Rocky Mountains. I went out to the Rocky Mountains and I drove, and drove out there and they were majestic. Man, they're beautiful. First time you ever, ever seen them. And I went out there and, and I, w I was all, all alone. I just drove out there myself. I was all alone, and uh, I, was, uh, I was thinking at that time, and he'd seen see something so magnificent, so beautiful, and there was nobody that was with me, and I was thinking, boy, I wish I had somebody with me to enjoy this with me. I wish there was somebody with me just to, to be captivated the way I am with this, and we could, we could even talk about it. Well, that's what it's like when you come into this anointing with Jesus. It is so powerful uh, that you want everybody to experience it. You want the power of God to be released. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus.